<laughs> so we've got so much in the service, I'm going to try to go a little quicker. Um, but what I'm looking at is, as we come to Pentecost, and one of the reasons that we're going through the whole E100 series, is I wanted you to see that the church is not just about a group of people that come together and pass time until we get to a destination. The church is not just a religious institution that we come to maintain. That it's not just about paying the bills and, and, and having the committees meet and have the right number of potlucks and all that kind of thing. <laughs> we're not here to be an institution to be maintained, but we're here to be a movement that actually makes a difference in the world around us. And that's what brings me to my sabbatical theme this summer, is I've been in the midst of a religious institution my whole life. That's what I was trained to do, is maintain a religious institution, make sure that you get the religious goods and services that you want when you come here on Sundays. But what if we're supposed to be more than that? What if we're supposed to be a movement of people filled with the Holy Spirit who live out our lives in the world and become a blessing to others? And so I'm going to be looking at three movements in the history of the church that will help me to learn some more about what it looks like to be a movement. And the first one I'm going to look at is the Moravians, and I've talked a lot about the Moravians. But here on Pentecost, the Moravians, a group of people who, from the present day Czech Republic, Moravia, Bavaria, um, not Bavaria, Moravia and... Uh, Bohemia. Bohemia, that's it, yes. We've got our, our Czech expert out here, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but they came and they lived with an accounts uh, estate in Germany and to have some religious freedom. But we talked today about Pentecost. Did you think Pentecost really only happened once and then it's over? According to the Moravians, they had their own Pentecost back in 1727. As they worshipped, the Holy Spirit came upon this small group of religious refugees, and they ended up turning the world upside down. They stopped being just a religious organization or institution, and they started going out. The Spirit filled them, and they got excited about prayer. They had a 100-year, 24-7 prayer vigil. They got excited about world missions at a time when nobody cared about doing world missions. In this small community of a few hundred people sent over a thousand missionaries out over the next hundred years, more than the rest of the Protestants in Europe combined. They started to see that their life was not just about getting together and taking care of themselves, but it was about becoming a blessing to their neighbor. And they were willing to sell themselves as slaves so that they could share the good news of Jesus with others. They learned what it was to be a movement and not just an institution. Then we go to Norway and learn about a guy named Hans Nielsen Haugi, who was a farmer's son. He was out plowing one day, and he had his own Pentecost experience. <coughs> While he was out plowing, he received a call from God to go and minister. And he took that call seriously, and he would walk over 10,000 miles through Norway in the next 15 years or so, bringing renewal and revival to the church. But not only would he bring religious revival, but he would bring... Revival to a nation that was just going to be forming during those years in 1814, where because he was an entrepreneur, because he was smart, he ended up sharing ideas that he gained as he walked across Norway about farming and business and industry, and ended up bringing a renewal that would cause Norway to start well, not just religiously, but economically. And then I'm going to go and look at another movement that wasn't in Norway, wasn't in Germany, but was here in the United States, and once again, movements often show up in places you don't expect them to show up. Because it's not about us, it's about God. So I'm going to be looking at a movement that happened back in the Summer of Love. How many of you were alive during the Summer of Love back in the 60s? A few of you were. I was, about to, I was born about that time. But at the same time as all these young people were rebelling and they were getting away from all the things in the world, guess what God was doing? God was beginning a renewal. God was pouring out the Spirit upon a, a, a bunch of hippies that would end up becoming the Jesus People Movement. And so, what can we learn about what happens when God's Spirit shows up and turns people from just being an institution that's dry and dead to be a movement that transforms <coughs> society? So that's what I'm going to be looking at. <coughs> Jesus' disciples, he'd heard him teach about the Kingdom of God while he was doing his ministry before his crucifixion. And what is it that he talked about after his resurrection? It says that he taught them about the kingdom of God. That's what he kept on talking about. And they got confused because they had, as the people of Israel, they had this understanding the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Israel was going to be built up when the Messiah came. And they said, now the time Israel is going to be built up. 
Because now the time when finally the rest of the world will come and serve us and honor us and make us the center of the world and make us feel important. And Jesus said, you still don't get it, do you? I've been teaching you about the kingdom the whole time. It's not about you being lifted up above everybody else so that they serve you. But what is going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and fill you and cause you to be full of God's presence and love so that you go down and out into the world to serve them. That's what the kingdom of God is about. As I've been thinking about the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, I think sometimes we have a confused picture of what spirituality is. That spirituality, does anybody else agree with, you, with me that your definition, or as mine has been, was when I was younger, was that spirituality is that thing that causes me to disconnect from the world and be lifted up above all the needs of the world and be close to God. Anybody feel like that's what spirituality is? It's what causes you to disengage so you can even have your own private time with God? To some extent, but who was the most spiritual person that ever lived? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus came out of the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. He went to his home synagogue in Nazareth full of the Holy Spirit. He read out of the scroll of Isaiah. And what did it say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news, to um, help the blind to see, the lame to walk, give good news to the poor. What if spirituality is not what disconnects us from the world and makes us light and float away from all the needs of the world. But what if spirituality is becoming more substantive, becoming even denser spiritually, so that instead of floating away from the needs of the world, it actually sinks us down more fully into the needs of the world. So that when we are more spiritual, we're going to be closer to the need of our neighbor. We're going to love our neighbor better. We're going to be more engaged. And I think that's what I want to invite us to look at, is when the Holy Spirit comes upon individuals or communities, that it doesn't disengage us so that we just get together and do our religious stuff every week and then go home and come back the next week to do our religious stuff. But when the Holy Spirit fills us, it actually makes us, the denser is probably not, the more substantive, <laughs> that it gives us more of a sense of who we are, fully alive, fully who God created us to be, so that it actually causes us to not be satisfied just staying in the building, but it helps us to see our neighbor, helps us to see the need of those around us. Jesus says to his disciples that just as I have come to be an advocate, I have come to show you what the Father is like and not just to be religious. I've come to show you the kingdom of God, which is God's activity now and not just a destination. I'm going to send you another advocate who is, will keep on doing what I've been doing. That other advocate is the Holy Spirit. And he's going to do all the same things that I've been doing. The Holy Spirit is going to show you the Father, not just as an intellectual concept, but as an experience. The Holy Spirit is going to pour out God's love into your heart, not just teach you intellectually about God's love, but give you an experience of God's love. And the Holy Spirit is going to continue to lead you into God's purposes, because you can't handle, like every time I hear, what's that movie? You can't handle the truth. No. You can't handle everything right now that I'm ready to do in through your life. So he's going to take you from where you are and lead you. So that whole idea of Romans 8 is a description of what it looks like to be people who are learning how to live in the kingdom. Learning how to move from being religious people motivated by fear to being a movement motivated by love. Being led by the Spirit. For who are the children of God? They are those who are led by the Spirit. And what is the world waiting for? What is all creation waiting for as we read in Romans 8? Is it waiting for the church to get everybody together for an hour on Sundays to talk to each other about God and then go home and forget about God? No. The church is waiting, the creation is waiting with eager longing for the children of God to be revealed. The children of God are the ones who don't just go to a religious institution. The children of God are the ones who are filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit. They're the ones who don't go back to fear to motivate them, but they are motivated by love. They're the ones who know that they have a Father who loves them and not a judge who's trying to motivate them through fear. They're the ones who know that they have gifts to share for the sake of their neighbor. They're the ones who are so secure that nothing can separate them from God's love, that they don't need to worry about themselves anymore. They can go and serve and love their neighbor because they know they're in good hands. So what I want to invite you to think about on this Pentecost is, do you want to be spiritual? 
Yes, it's great to have those nice private times with God because they do transform us, just like Franz Nielsen Howe was transformed out plowing on his own. Those times when we have those experiences. But those experiences are not meant to keep you disconnected so it's just you and God. Those experiences are meant to send you even more fully into the world. So my prayer for you and my prayer for us is during this sabbatical as I go away, so you stop having that religious guy doing everything for you, that you start saying, God, what do you want to do through me when he's not around? That as I go away, that I stop doing all the religious stuff and going through all the motions that need to happen every week, and I actually say, God, how do I, because I feel like I'm not very dense anymore. Maybe my sons would say the opposite. But I feel like I'm not very dense spiritually, not very substantive spiritually, because I'm so busy doing things. And what I need to do is I need to get away. And I need to say, God, uh, I don't want to learn how to float away and spend time with you. I want to spend this time so that, I think that's the difference. Religion is about doing the things so that we get to go to be with God. We might love our neighbor, but we love our neighbor for our own purposes, so that we can make God love us. A movement is opposite. A movement is where you experience, it's, you're not aiming toward God's presence. A movement is where you experience God's presence 24 hours a day. And it's out of that presence that you end up being a blessing to your neighbor and you end up becoming who God created you to be. So may we learn how to transition from being a religion that needs to be maintained to being a movement that can't be stopped. That's what Pentecost is about. That's what the Moravian Pentecost was about. That was what Hans Nielsen Hauge's Pentecost was about. That was what the Pentecost that those hippies experienced back in California in the 60s was about. It was about God loving us enough to fill us with His Spirit, not just for our sake, but for the sake of our neighbor.